Wasn't that a wonderful way to start our worship today? Welcome to all of you who are here today. Welcome to those of you who are online with us. You know, <clears throat> I always feel so much gratitude to see people gathered in the church in the midst of a troubled time in our world. And yet, here we are, in spite of turbulence and war, we are here doing what is good for our souls, aren't we? And to worship and to hear God speak to us in the preached word and in music, and to be reminded again that we worship Him who is the King of all nations. Amen. This morning, we're blessed to have eight musicians from the Music and Arts Institute here at UPPC who are going to, who are playing in our orchestra and it is amazing how the local and the global come together sometimes in the church today one of our uh, instrumentalists our cellist is uh, uh, Tabitha Buzanov uh, whose family is here and they are from the Ukraine they have family in the root in the Ukraine and in Kiev and other places and we're just so glad you're here with us and we welcome you to be with us <clears throat> For those of you who are new to UPPC, the Music and Arts Institute's mission is to provide a spiritually rich environment for young people learning music, which develops their character and their spirits, and, and also to raise up future musicians and worship leaders in the church, and also to build bridges with our community. And uh, it's a wonderful mission, part of the mission of our church. And um, this is something we're going to celebrate today. Will the eight students who are part of the Institute of Music, would you please stand right now so we can recognize you? Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to be continuing our terrific series on Dreaming Bigger, and later in the service, you'll hear Pastor Aaron speak to us about how our giving uh, relates to our ability to expand this church's mission. But today, I want to remind you that your gift that you give today is a sign of life like a fruit-bearing tree. And I invite you to join us in our mission to the world by giving online at uppc.org. It's very easy to find the little icon you click for giving. You can drop off a check or cash in the basket right out in the narthex there, or you can simply mail in a check or bring it by. And today as we begin our worship and we think about our giving, I would I would give to you today Paul's words found in Romans um, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual worship. Let us stand and sing together. Let us break bread together.
You may be seated. Hello. Good morning, UPVC. Um, I'm Jill McMullen. I'm the Minister of Care and Welcome and Connect. And today I get to do the Welcome and Connect part of my job. Uh, a week and a half ago, we had an essentials class, which is our membership class. And I'd like to introduce you to those who participated in that. Barbara Davis, Ruthie and Jerry Craven. You guys can come on up. Yeah. Allison Karanja and her sweet little girl, Rahab, uh, Sherry Painter, and John and Bonnie Washer. Yeah. So you guys can spread that way. Yeah. Go that right. way. He doesn't bite. Yeah. Um, so they part we, we tried something new. We tried a Wednesday night deal, and we had a great time together. We had dinner. Uh, Pastor Aaron and Pastor Mike taught more about what UPPC is, who we are, what we believe, and uh, these wonderful people, along with the others that are listed for you in the bulletin, some we'll be recognizing at our next service, they all said, yeah, this is a place I want to commit to. Yeah. And so here we are today. They're committing to us, and we're committing to them. Yeah, thank so Pastor you, Aaron, thank take you. away. Isn't this a great-looking bunch right here? I think we're better because of them. Thank you. Yep, yep. It takes such courage in our day to step across the threshold of a new church and to make friendships and sit in the cafe and, and get to know new people and, and step out in faith and trust us just like we're going to entrust you to be a part of this gift that is community. I have some words in the sermon for you today, and I'm going to let those speak in just a few moments, but I want to honor the decision you've made to join the body of Christ in this place, knowing that Jesus has one church in Pierce County, in our country, and in the world. And so wherever you may go, that you are members of the body of Christ, and Jesus has uh, adopted you into God's family by way of, of his grace and his movement in your life long before you could ever recognize it uh, yourself. And so today we recognize that. And along with the Apostle Paul who says whenever we uh, speak with our mouth what we believe in our heart about the lordship of Jesus Christ, we are saved. And so your proclamation and your declaration of faith today is a, a sign and it is a reminder of salvation in your life. And so I uh, invite you to respond with a robust yes. And then same for the congregation, I'm watching you. Okay. First of all, being created in the image of God. These are holy questions, friends. Being created in the image of God, do you acknowledge that that image is broken because of sin and that you need God's love? Do you? Yeah. And do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior? He's bringing you back into the fullness of God's love. Do you? And will you, to the best of your ability, seek to live a life that reflects the love of Jesus in the way that you treat your neighbors and how you encounter others and that you live your discipleship out in a way that honors Jesus Christ? Will you? And will you seek to serve the church of Jesus Christ wherever you may go, but in this particular place of UPPC with your time, your energy, your imagination, your resources, and your purity in love? Will you? Good answer. Good answer. And for us as a church, this is the gift that we receive new members into our church, and we're better because of it. We were better when you came, and of course we're better when they come. They offer gifts, anointing of the Holy Spirit upon their baptism that now is going to be put into use into the mission of this place. And so do you, as the members of UPPC, receive these new members into the fellowship of our church? Will you include them in your circles of friendship and bread breaking? And will you uh, adopt them into the family, the fold that is this church? Will you? Yeah. Good answer. Will you? This is a beautiful picture, and I just maybe want you to keep your eyes open and see this. But friends, will you extend a hand to our new members? We receive that, and let's pray. Lord, for these are friends and brothers and sisters who have been adopted into the family of God. We receive them wholly here, knowing that, that their stories will enrich us and make us better as a church. Will you help them to find fellowship and uh, friendship, connection, place for mission and service? And will you grow them to know the deep and wide love that is Jesus Christ? that they may follow Jesus in a way that inspires all of us to be made more and more into the image of Christ Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We welcome our new members to UPC. Yep, thank you, friends. Thank you. Yeah.
Amen. And if you are a, a child or young person who landed here today, you got an extra bonus with this wonderful music that we have today. And uh, we're going to excuse the children to go to their classes at this time, and, and we're going to pray for them while they go and are, are learning. So let us pray. Lord God, we pray for our children and youth who are here with us today that they would know how much they matter to you. As they go to their classes today, may they learn that you are their rock on which they can stand. Today and in the coming week, lead them, guide them, and bring them comfort. In Jesus' name, amen. And may you go and be blessed, children and youth. Well, good morning, EPPC. It's such a gift to be with you today, and of course, we get an extra treat in, in the music and our worship. It's inspiring to hear you worship and sing this morning. Thank you for that. I've been looking forward to today because of what it represents in the life of our church, and I'm going to talk a little about that in a few moments. But I can think of a few other times where there's such a, a tangible expression of our collective community than when we talk about the we over the me. The we over the me, and let me explain what that looks like in the coming minutes. We've been thinking a lot about this concept of dreams. We even have clouds that remind us that we can elevate, we can, we can get our heads up in space that entertains all sorts of dreams, that we've been talking about the power of dreams, the kind that reflect our deepest aspirations and longings, and how we've lived through a pandemic that was a dream killer. And it suppressed dreams, and it suppressed so much of the life that we longed to live together. When was the last time you imagined something different or greater in your own personal wants and goals? Is there more to this life than the script you and I have been following? Is that a question that we have the courage to ask? Uh, we sent them by mail this week, but if you didn't bring that with you, in the pews are dream cards. And I want to invite you just to reach ahead and grab one and and this has spiritual meaning and not just an exercise for a few faithful that want to put their dreams out on the wall in the narthex or the foyer area. But it is a provoking of our imaginations. It's a provoking of our faith and what we would love to see God do in our midst, in our lives, and in our community. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the service. So if you'll hold that dream card... Now, because of what this day means, I want to share with you two beautiful passages, and one is from the Old Testament, the book of Habakkuk, which a lot of us do our devotionals out of, and uh, <laughs> Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. Listen to the word of the Lord. Things weren't going well during the time of Habakkuk. A lot of fra fractured community and a lot of individual pursuits and sin, and Habakkuk was about to give up, and this is the word that the Lord gave him. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Pardon me. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A little background. Habakkuk was a prophet in Jerusalem about 650 years prior to this moment of Pentecost unity. 
Habakkuk was frustrated. There seemed to be no answer that God wasn't doing anything new, it seemed. And he wasn't bringing about the dream of a unified and holy people, a peaceful people to bear in the world. But God's response was to wait for the dream. Wait for a a communal movement of the Holy Spirit in a people. And God's response to Habakkuk was here in chapter 2. It's extraordinary. God says, here's my answer. Write it down and count on it. Mark my words. It will come. Believe. It's so hard to wait, isn't it? But then here in Acts, the dream is realized. The people are living selflessly and communally. Notice the number of times the communal is emphasized over the individual. Just in these short verses, they devoted themselves Everyone was filled. All the believers were together. They sold property to give to anyone. Every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes together. All the people, their number grew daily. It's communal. There's just something that happens when the we is bigger than the me. The acronym TEAM was emblazoned, was forged into my heart and mind, every player on our team at PLU under Coach Frosty Westering. And it wouldn't be a week that would go by without him mentioning what a team is. A, A team is this, together everyone achieves more. Together everyone achieves more. But we've talked about this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit deeper level of this. The tidal wave of individuality in our day is so difficult to resist. It's like we believe everyone, if they operate alone, will achieve more. And I want to share something that's been working in me before we talk about the dream here in Acts. Okay? Before every gift and good news, there has to be a prophetic word. And clarity about the times that we live in. Spirituality in our time is like no other in human history. In our time, spirituality has been reduced to individuals' journeys. It's been made to be about Jesus and me. It doesn't go very far where I'm having conversations with people just in community or Uh, here in Tacoma, and they'll say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christian, I just don't believe in organized religion, or I don't go to church, because I don't need that. It's just about me and Jesus. It's about my personal walk with Jesus. Not entirely bad to think about our individual journeys with God, but we need community if we are to see God's dream realized. I'm preaching to the choir, literally, Because you're sitting here, right? So when we forget that, which so often it's easy to do, when you abandon the communal, you get what we see in our broader culture, which is a collection of, and I don't mean this as as a judgment, but it is the state of our times, a collection of adolescents that are self-centered and self-interested, may even be communally interested, but even that interest has a self-interest component. The idea of giving money or energy or attention to things that you're not passionate about is unthinkable. I've said for forever how I love the church of Jesus Christ because there are certain things my heart breaks for and I will just, I don't just give it away. If it involves kids, if it involves little kids, teenage kids, college kids, and it involves them helping, helping them know Jesus, I just... I give stuff away. I just want to be a part of that. It melts my heart. But then there's ministries in the church that don't melt my heart. Don't get me as excited. But I love that somewhere in the body of Christ, there's a lack of self-interest. It's instead the communal interest, that the needs of the community are ahead of my individual pursuits and passions. And church initiation is part of that. We welcomed member, new members today. Church initiation in the traditional sense was never meant for the individual Membership in the church was never meant for the individual, if you can believe it. It was meant as an initiation into the communal, 
the community took precedence. It wasn't about personal growth or what makes me a better person, as good as that may be. It's an act of sacrifice on behalf of the individual towards the community. Now, that's such a strange thought for us because everything in the culture and the cultural milieu that we're surrounded in, the waters in which we swim, is about me. I go to therapy for me. I go to church for me. I go to work for me. But the work of Jesus in us is to crack that nut open, the core of us open, and realize I am myself, but I am also a part of something bigger, which the Spirit of God does in us and awakens us to seeing and serving the other, inclusion of outsiders, of collective movements of God's people as opposed to individual pursuits. And we're so conditioned to think, I am special. I am the generation that grew up in the late 70s and 80s. And there was a rising phenomenon even in storytelling. Think about this. The archetype of the special person who alone would save the day. It's the heroic architect seen in characters like Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. Harry Potter. Bilbo Baggins. It is the Lone Ranger who, who alone can save and actualize. We're conditioned even in our storytelling to think, I am special, and to climb higher and higher this ladder of growth and betterment. And the script is so seductive. In order to belong in the broader culture, we have to self-improve. We have to perform in order to belong. Think of all the ways that messaging is given to us. I have to perform to be accepted, to be allowed in. How do I convince you to let me in and, and show you that I'm worthy of belonging? And so it's up to me to convince you. It's, it's a bit of an adolescent pursuit like when we were in junior high, but, but it continues on in the cultural milieu, that I have to convince you that I belong and that you'll accept me. And when I'm trying to be special, the flow is always towards who? Me. This is social media at its worst, to get likes or views rather than the communal exchange. But there is no exchange if it's about me being special and the rest of the world not being special. It's all towards me. So part of God's calling for us is to reclaim the collective we and to lay down that self-improvement plan and script and instead to see and value the gift of the communal we, the belonging we all have and the need we all have that we're part of a special community. Do you realize how special this church is? I have some amazing news in just a few minutes to share with you. But this is a remarkable church. And of course I'm biased, right? <laughs> but you are amazing. We are amazing. The things we're able to do together. The dreams we dream. And you have gifts to give, friends. You have gifts to give and gifts to receive. And God's dream is one of mutuality and exchange of both giving and receiving. I've said this before, it's the perichoretic nature of the, of the Trinity. This is so important to me. It was part of my thesis in seminary and then upon my ordination some nine years ago. The perichoresis is the self-giving and receiving of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father points to the Son, says, look, look at Jesus, my Son. The Son points to the Spirit, says, the Counselor's coming. He's going to fill you and do greater things than even I could do. And the Spirit is saying, look at the Father and the Son. They're self-giving. It's a circle dance. And out of that circle dance comes an explosion of life and light. It is the communal no individual part of the Trinity is saying, look at me, I'm special. Instead, the Trinity is saying, look at the other. Look at what the Son is doing, look what the Spirit is doing, look what the Father is doing. It is communal. We are born in the image of God, which is not singular, it is communal. 
And once we understand that, we realize that our deepest longings and our heart's pursuits will be realized in community, together, where we join the we. One of the most powerful moments I ever experienced was actually entirely secular, but it was beautiful. It was when I took my little boys in 2013 to uh, the best picture of heaven I could have ever imagined experiencing. And that was the Super Bowl parade for the Seahawks down the center of Seattle. Okay, right? It's a holy moment. <laughs> but seriously, I just remember, I, we, we got there early. It was terribly cold. Um, I made them suffer through it, but they're so glad. And we, we made several different kind of transitions as the parade was making its way to the stadium. And it was wall-to-wall people. It was, it was beautiful. And, and, of course, there was an object of praise and worship, but I'm not going to, you know, pull at that low-hanging fruit. It, it was a picture of heaven, the streets being filled with God's people. It was just beautiful. That's the dream. It's the we. It's the, the dream of community. Now let me share with you just a, a vulnerability. I remember in graduate school, I was back in Iowa for intensives, and I was working so hard. I was working full-time here at EPPC, full-time student, and uh, we had just... Uh, had our fourth child. Life was busy. And, uh, and I worked so hard to get my papers and exams done in order to get home to be fully present to my family. And I would be in the library until late, uh, closing at midnight every single night. And I'd hand in my papers on the last day of class, even though they were due a month later. And the professors were impressed, and my classmates called me the golden boy. I even received an award for most promising graduate. Everything on the outside looked good, but inside I was really lonely and afraid and cold even. I was on a mission. I was going to get things done. And I was going to do the the right thing by my family and and by my church. But I missed out on the trivia nights at the bar with my classmates. I was so driven for the pressures of me that I didn't see the gift that was my community of professors and classmates. And I wish I'd taken my professors out to coffee and spent more presence time with them and realized the gift that was that unique and very temporary community. We'll never be back in the same place again in that way. I have regret over that. We cling to these identities Who will I be if I let go of this insatiable pursuit of my individual identity? See, now this is the hard word. I think we've made agreements with the adversary that we didn't even know we were making. This spirit of death that makes us the center of it all. And it's a collusion we've made over and over again, backing our way towards a grave where we're dying, we're dying alone every day because of the emptiness of that script, the emptiness of the script of individuality. And so we have to acknowledge something. It is the emptiness that we feel inside from that pursuit of individualism. This is the lament our broader culture needs to experience. This is the lament that we need to grapple with, friends. A grief that we have to acknowledge the emptiness that we feel inside from the pursuit of all that is status, rank, wealth, competition, dominance, advantage. Why do we pursue all those things? Who told you you have to live by that script? In that pursuit of individualism is an absence of something that we need. And I think it's fair to say that we're addicted to individualism in our culture. And it's the breeding ground for what we saw in pandemic. And that is loneliness. Loneliness. That was never God's dream. From the very beginning, 
and the Holy Trinity is the light and life of God spun out universes as well as molecules. As God spun out even creating you, that you were never meant to be alone. And God wants you and me to be forever in community with the Holy Trinity forever. God has a dream for us for that. One where we of community is bigger than the me of individualism. A place where we share ritual together and we grieve together, we sing together, we dance together, we say thank you together, we share meals together, we tell stories together, and we dream dreams for God's kingdom coming to this world together. And friends, we need each other in that. There's a concept called mimemic desire. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I maybe have mentioned it before, but mimemic desire is that you actually have no desires inside of you that are unique to you. That all we do is mimic the desires of others that we spend time with. You spend time with people who ride motorcycles, guess what? You're suddenly looking at Harley Davidson's. Because you mimic the desire of those you spend with. That's why I always say, the friendships that you have and the people you spend time with will largely determine the outcome and the satisfaction of your life. Because you will see yourself desiring that which you're surrounded by. It's called mimemic desire, mimicking the desire of others. When we're in community, we start to get infected with the desires of the spirit and of how other people see the world or experience need. We absorb that. And we start to dream bigger, God-shaped dreams. And we see that our primary satisfactions uh, are going to take precedence over the secondary satisfactions that our culture says you must be addicted to. Did you know that we're the highest consuming culture on the planet, we Americans? We in America make up 5% of the world's population, and yet we consume 25% of the goods of the world. What is going on? Maybe it's that God is telling us something, and that's this. You can never get enough of what you don't need. That's the essence of addiction, right? You can never get enough of what you don't need. You want more of what you don't need. You want more and more and more, which is why we have millionaires and billionaires who are craving what? More. With the illusion that that will satisfy. Right? But there can never be enough if you aren't addressing the core issue, which is this emptiness. And this isn't just with money. It happens with fitness. What's the end game? It happens with investments, of course. Happens with work and overworking or workaholism. It's an ever ascending growth. When is lifting weights enough? When is enough enough? And here's the gift of our text. And now I really want to dive in. The individual is secondary to the communal in the Acts church because it's the communal that we need and we want. It's the transcendent, it's to see the stories and experience the life together that transforms our hearts. And it helps us address the emptiness of the me culture we're in that never satisfies with something beautiful and richer. And in the language of the first church here in Acts, the communal dream here answers the question, the opposite of emptiness is not fullness, it's presence. The opposite of emptiness is not fullness, it's presence. It is presence, it is embodiment, it's communal. That is the opposite of emptiness. It's not more, it's what the Catholics call mass. It's not more, it's mass, it's the gathering, it's the we. I think the pandemic, one of the great gifts, if we can reframe the pandemic, is we all realized how much we really do need each other. The we, love and power that aren't from individuals and our own strength, but through the communal. Now, this passage of Acts is often regarded as laying down the four marks of the church, and I want to close with this briefly. The first is the apostles' teaching. The second is the common life of the community. The third is the breaking of bread. And the fourth are the prayers. These four go together. You can't separate them. Or leave one out without damage to the whole. Where no attention is given to teaching and to constant lifelong shaping and formation of Christian learning. We revert to the worldviews around us. This is why being in 
gathered worship or in study of God's word is so crucial for us. Otherwise, the social pressures of our day will form us away from Jesus. And then second is that when we ignore the common life of the Christian family, which is what we call fellowship, it's more than, than friendship. It's, it's even more than just like staying in the same place. It's a spirit union. Well, then we become isolated and we find it difficult to live in a sustained faith. And then whenever we do all these things but we neglect prayer or having meals with each other, we forget that Christians are supposed to be heaven and earth people where heaven and earth come together and we experience something of the divine entering into our world. Imagine an existence where there was no common life built around a shared belief in Jesus. Imagine rampant individual pursuits with no desire to heal the wounds of Tacoma or to help with food poverty or the battered women's shelter or refugee families, some of whom are from Ukraine. And this week they're so grieved and scared and praying for their homeland. Imagine a world where that doesn't happen because all we care about is me. My individual pursuits. Imagine that. That would be empty because it is empty. But imagine a we. Imagine continuing and growing in our own experience of single family life. When you live together under one roof like we do here at the good ship, the good home UPPC, you don't just see this chair, this table, this bottle of milk, this loaf of bread as mine. You see it as ours. It's ours. It's beautifully communal. And the early Christian impulse inspired by the Holy Spirit was to see life in just that way. We are family. We are God's family. We are brothers and sisters. And our baptism, our shared faith, our fellowship at the bread-breaking uh, moments in our church life and in our homes all point in this direction. It is a foretaste of heaven. That's what we experience together here in community at UPPC, a foretaste. Now, for the good news. You want good news? Yeah, yeah? I think we need some good news. Uh, we had an interesting just, just phenomenon. We were tracking it, and I'm told by our finance elders, I don't, I'm not someone who has expertise in this area, but, but that... Uh, we needed, in December alone, to meet all the ministry needs and commitments. We needed $422,000 to come in uh, to, in giving from the entire congregation just in December alone to meet the communal needs of our church and beyond. We had a shortfall up to that point, and uh, it, was, it was large. It was, I think, uh, well over $70,000. And as of the final account I received from our finance office, you want to know what the giving for December was alone last year or just two months ago? $525,815 came in. Yep. Yep. And I know, I, I know the muted thing here is that we don't want to brag or like get bloated or anything. That's faithfulness. Where else does this happen? That's our cup overflowing. Now let me tell you what that does. It, a, it emboldens your elders and your pastors, but it should also embolden you. And when you think about a dream card, what would you like to see happen? Our leaders are listening. We want to dream bigger dreams. We know we have the debt for the building. It's about $3.7 million. And what was so wonderful, if you can believe this, last year with not only the giving overages but also us managing expenses and underspending, we had a, uh, a uh, total amount of $186,000 that was able to be put in our reserves during a pandemic. Oh, Friends, way to put your faith. Jesus was, was absolutely right when he says, you want to see someone's heart? You look at their pocketbook. And you see, you have been doing it. You've been putting Christ first in your giving. And that resource is very real ministry, like our refugee ministry that's serving families, even families from the Ukraine. Isn't that beautiful? We didn't know that what was going to be happening. But $186,000. Okay, and now we can put that towards our mortgage, and we need to keep working at that. I said that last week. We need to keep working at our, uh, our mortgage because that, that can end up being a barrier to dreams in the future. But you've done such a beautiful job of revitalizing our church and our spaces and being faithful to giving. 
and that emboldens me as your pastor. And so my invitation now is, and in the coming moments, is we're going to have some time in just a few minutes to dream bigger. What dreams and visions is God putting on your heart for our church? And not just in the arena of our pocketbook. The mission of Christ can't be defined by, by budget figures, although there's some in our church that love that, and I love that they love that. Um, but it's, it's bigger. It's, it's about people. It's about you and our community. What is it that God would put on your heart to dream bigger in? Would you sit with that question as we, as we respond in worship? And then in a few moments, I want to I talk about that dream bigger card and what that could mean for you and for me and for us. Maybe so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, will you stand now and let us sing, take my life and let it be. seated. Now this is for everyone. I don't want anyone to, to check out of this moment, but I want you just to take this card. And uh, I'm told by our, our finance team and uh, some changes this year to what we call our commitment giving. Uh, it allows our elders to dream and to plan for the year ahead. And it comes through what we call commitments or faith commitments for the next year. It also is the discipline that Christian households can use to set themselves up for successful tithing in their life with their resources, which we're called to in Christ's church. This helps us be the church to Tacoma and beyond. I've taken great pride in this. We don't advertise this, but UPPC is a unique church in Tacoma in that we give away a large portion of the giving of our church towards kingdom initiatives in, uh, in uh, parachurch and nonprofit work that is honoring Jesus Christ. 
And so this has ripple effects all over Tacoma. And so I wanted to show you real briefly what's changing this year. We're not going to be doing pledge cards or something that you walk forward as much as it's going to be happening uh, online through our uh, giving tab on the website. This uh, is what just it looks like. It's very simple. But uh, you just go on to the giving tab at UPPC and you put in what you feel like God may be setting you up for or calling you to for your commitment of giving in the coming year. This is important for all of us as we place the stewardship of our lives in the hands of the Lord and we do that with our own uh, uh, resources and giving. But more important to that in our elder work is not up just about what is it that you want to commit to the Lord in your finances and resources, but what do you want to commit in terms of your heart sources and your dreams and what you want for our church to be about. And so we have um, a team that put together the rendition of Dream On from a couple weeks ago, the song that we, that we played and it's an invite, uh, invitation for us to dream on. When the world says you're crazy, you PC, you crazy Christians. You've been drinking wine at nine in the morning. <laughs> Acts two, we know that, right? Is you dream on. You dream on. What is it that God has put on your heart that you would love to have be the dream? I want you to now take the discipline of, of actually putting that down in the words of Habakkuk. Put that down that revelation down on paper. And after the service, we'll put them on the, the wall board and we'll learn and grow from each other. Amen? Amen. So this is time for you. Maybe you and your spouse or, or you alone in the pew is just take some time and, and be inspired by the music, but then also to consider what is it God is asking of me to dream today.
could we pull that off? <sighs> dream on, dream on. Even when you're afraid, all your dreams may be gone. Then gather around the circle of community here at UPPC and dream the dreams together that God may have for us. Will you take this, friends, in a spirit of faith? Will you, uh, will you put this on the board after the service and honor God with your dreams? Let me pray. God, I know that there's a component here that has to do with our stewardship and our commitment of our gifts to you this next year, but also our hearts. And would you awaken our hearts that, uh, that we could dream God-shaped dreams together, whatever that may look like. Thank you for the gift of the communal we that we so need and desperately long for. Protect that in this place, Lord Jesus. Help us to experience more of the depths of that as we grow in faith together, we pray. And for all of our gifts, Lord, we in humility recognize you are the giver of everything. You gave us the gifts that help us earn a living and gave us gifts that help us serve others. And so we thank you, the giver of all gifts. And we return to you uh, what uh, is uh, due the honor of your name. And, and we recognize that that is uh, uh, important in our lives and in this time. And so receive our gifts and our commitments in the coming days and weeks as we uh, make our faith commitments for 2022. And all of this that you may be honored and praised in this community forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We're going to have you stay standing, and uh, Martha's prepared a prayer for us today that's, uh, I think, a gift, and, and this is a dark week, and those of us who have heart connection to Ukraine and, and the dangers around the world, this is important for us to gather in prayer, but also the grief that we have. So, Martha, will you lead us? Yes. Nowhere, uh, Aaron, does the me becoming the we become more incarnated and lived out than in our common prayer together, and so... We're going to live that out now with our common prayer. Uh, we have had three deaths in our community this last week. And uh, yesterday, Mike Moline uh, joined the church triumphant, and we, our sympathy goes with his wife, Margaret. And uh, we also remember the family of Joan Brown, who passed away on February 10th, and her memorial will be on March 16th at 2 p.m., and our sympathy also goes to Don Davidson at the loss of her father, Steve Forbes, uh, who passed away on February 22nd, and his memorial will be Sunday, March 13th at 2 p.m. Um, I know that all of us, our, our hearts and our minds are very concerned about the people of Ukraine, and our hearts go out also. Um, we, our hearts go out to those who 
uh, are at the borders as refugees. We know many women and children are having to leave brothers, fathers, uh, behind uh, in, uh, to try to seek safety. We know that the elderly are, are not able to leave. And um, we also want to remember that there's a church in the Ukraine. And um, it is a church, uh, one of one branch of the church I've spent several weeks with, the Transcarpathian Reformed Church, our Reformed sisters and brothers there. We remember the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and we remember also uh, the, the Baptist Church. You will be interested to know that Young Life, which we support here, has 33 workers in the Ukraine, and there are hundreds of volunteers. Yeah. So we really want to remember our brothers and sisters, the church, the, uh, who are part of the one church, who are bearing witness to Jesus in the midst of war. Uh, a few years ago, UPPC was blessed to work with two college interns for a year, Lauren and Yulia. And Yulia was from the Ukraine and still has a lot of family there. Some of you may remember her. This weekend, she sent us a prayer request uh, for her family who is in the Ukraine. And we're going to show this to you. Uh, you can hear and see it directly right now on, on the video. Hi, I would really appreciate prayers for the family I have in Ukraine. Um, prayers for my aunt and uncle, Lesa and Ivan Sulem. Uh, they have two adult daughters that have their own families as well. Um, my cousin Anya and her husband Andri, they have two little boys, Rostek and Svetoslav. And then my cousin Olenka and her husband Oleg have two very very young little girls, Yeva and Danita. And then my other aunt, her name is Oksana, and she has two boys as well. Their names are Dennis and her oldest son, who's in his 20s. His name is Nazar. And in particular, I would love prayers for him since he is of draft age. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the life of Mike Moline, Joan Brown, and Steve Forbes, and for the gracious promise you give us in your son, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Comfort Margaret and Joan's family and Dawn in their grief, and surround them with your unfailing love. We lament, Lord, that you have a dream for us of changing swords into plowshares, and, and we lament that this, once again, this dream is not fulfilled. But we continue to pray for it and to work for it. Lord God, we pray for the people of Ukraine, and we also pray for the people of goodwill in Russia who are out getting arrested for their protest. And we, yes, we pray for our enemy because you asked us to. We pray especially for our, the children who, who are experiencing the tumult of war, that you may grant them comfort and peace. And Lord, we ask that you raise up peacemakers on all sides, that war and violence may cease. And give diplomats wisdom and understanding and trust as two sides meet together this week. We pray for the church in the nations involved, that they may be salt and light in a dark situation. And for the family of Yulia and Tabitha, that you may protect them from harm and soothe their wearied souls with the fruits of your spirit. And may your will overrule human willfulness, willfulness and may you bring peace to the land. And in response to death and war, Lord, we fervently lift the prayer your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I don't know about you, but that, uh, that's a prayer I needed this morning uh, in community with you all, so thank you. So we leave. I want to remind you that you just pulled a sticker on the back and you put it on the wall and join in the dreams of others this morning. And as we go, let us continue to, to live the dream that is God's kingdom, which is to be the people of God. And to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his spirit at work within us, to him be the glory both in Christ Jesus and in the church throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.